I now have the honor of introducing the 2024 Vaughn Lecture. The Vaughn Lecture Fund was established with a generous gift from the estate of Nora E. Vaughn in 1994 to support the ROM's annual Vaughn Lecture. Mrs. Vaughn established this endowment to continue ROM's tradition of selecting a staff member each year to share their most recent and compelling research with the public. This year's Vaughn Lecture perfectly exemplifies the theme, the theme of research for our shared future. For more than three decades, ROM has been conducting biodiversity surveys throughout the world and flash freezing tissue samples for DNA research on the evolution and biogeography of mammals, including bats. Mammologist Burton Lim leads this year's Vaughn Lecture, which highlights the groundbreaking work biologists are doing using ROM's extensive frozen tissue collections to understand the role of coronaviruses in the ecosystem. Research into why bat species carry coronaviruses in their populations while remaining asymptomatic has, been, has the potential to revolutionize our understanding of immunity and the transmission of viruses in our own human populations. I'd like to welcome Burton Lim, Assistant Curator of Mammals at ROM and 2024 Vaughn Lecture recipient to share his experiences with the Frozen Tissue Project. After a short talk, he will invite two of his collaborators to the stage for a conversation and to take some of your questions. Burton Lim is Assistant Curator of Mammology at the Royal Ontario Museum. He received a PhD in zoology from the University of Toronto. His primary research interests are the biodiversity and evolution of mammals, with a specialization in neotropical bats. Fieldwork has taken him to 30 countries throughout the world, with an emphasis on South America and Southeast Asia. Research focuses on comparative morphology and molecular biology, incorporating analysis of DNA variation and more recent genomic approaches. He's also worked on both the recent Blue Whale and Gray Whale exhibitions and gallery work, including the popular Bat Cave display. Burton will be joined later in the program by Dr. Connor Ricker from the University of Western Ontario, Michael Hiller, Professor of Comparative Genomics at the Center for Translational Biodiversity Genomics, and the Senckenberg Society for Nature Research in Frankfurt, Germany, who will be with us via Zoom. Please welcome ROM's 2024 Vaughn Lecture recipient, Burton Lim. Okay, uh, thank you, Valerie. Uh, and um, thank you for being here on uh, Chinese New Year's uh, weekend, uh, and also Super Bowl Sunday, as uh, some of you might know about that. Um, yeah, so we, we have a little bit of different format here, uh, and, and also I'd like to thank the, the Nora E. Vaughan uh, Lecture Fund uh, that has supported uh, this event uh, over many, many years. Um, yeah, so, uh, so we're going to uh, have a little bit of a different format um, uh, that Valerie uh, had sort of mentioned, so I'll start off with a half-hour talk, uh, looking at the collaborative research that we've done, uh, and then we'll have a, a panel discussion. Uh, so Connor from Western uh, is here, uh, but Michael from uh, Germany, uh, he will be uh, zooming in with us uh, virtually, uh, and then we'll end off with a, a Q&A. Uh, so uh, so uh, I want you guys to think of good questions to ask us um, uh, as we give our uh, presentation here. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about a, um, a collaborative project uh, that we've worked on, uh, looking at, uh, so this happened um, during the... Um, Everybody remembers uh, COVID-19, right, the pandemic. <laughs> um, sorry to have to bring it up. Um, uh, but unfortunately, uh, COVID is still out there. Um, it's just that uh, we have better ways to, uh, ways to deal with it. Uh, so I hope that um, some of the presentation, the research that we're doing, uh, will also uh, help uh, to, um, to stop a future uh, pandemic uh, from breaking out uh, in, uh, uh, so it doesn't become an, another global uh, event. Um, yeah, so um, as Valerie had mentioned, uh, I think uh, most of you probably know the ROM uh, or have gone through the Bat Cave uh, Gallery. 
at, at the museum. Uh, it's one of the most uh, popular galleries, especially you know, for kids. Um, and this is actually based on a, uh, a real uh, cave in uh, Jamaica. Let's get this clicker going here. I'm not sure where exactly to point it, but. <laughs> uh, let me get, okay, uh, there it goes. Um, yeah, so, so this is based on a Rio cave uh, in uh, Jamaica. Uh, but uh, most people probably don't know uh, the fact that um, uh, we actually have, uh, we do quite a bit of research, um, you know, not just on bats or mammals, but uh, research as, as we've heard uh, today in a lot of different areas. Uh, so specifically for mammals, um, you can see that on the bottom uh, row there, uh, in uh, the Western Hemisphere, um, we are, um, oops, sorry, let's get this back on track here. So if we just go back one more. Okay, uh, trying to go back here, <laughs> sorry about that. So it's possible the clicker may not be working that well this far away, maybe. Uh, or I can just use this one here. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, so, so we're on the slide here. Uh, yeah, so we, we have um, uh, basically the, uh, the, the tenth uh, largest collection of uh, mammals uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, but when we look uh, more closely at uh, the frozen tissue collections, um, so we're doing a little bit better at uh, the, the sixth largest collection. So, uh, so my talk will be uh, focus primarily on our uh, frozen tissue collection, which is uh, the newest and uh, most uh, fastest growing, expanding part of our collection. Um, yeah, so uh, of, um, of our uh, 20,000 plus uh, frozen tissue samples, most of them are bats, so most of the stuff we uh, look at are uh, the small species, uh, but we also do quite a bit of work on rodents. Um, uh, but when we actually look at the overall species diversity of mammals, we see that bats and the rodents uh, are the most uh, species-rich uh, groups of mammals anyways. Uh, so that uh, sort of correlates um, uh, with uh, the number of tissue samples uh, we have as well. Uh, and, um, you know, why do we study bats? Uh, well, because they, um, they do a lot of beneficial things. So uh, sometimes bats, you know, get sort of a bad rap. You know, people think that, you know, all of the bats are vampire, you know, blood-sucking vampire bats. Uh, well, that's not really true. Uh, so a lot of the bats, uh, they're in tropical places uh, primarily. They're uh, seed dispersers. Um, so it was great to hear uh, in Deb's talk earlier that uh, there are different ways of dispersing. So plants can disperse their seeds away from the parent uh, plant itself, but uh, sometimes the plants also need animals uh, to disperse. So, so bats are good uh, tropical seed dispersers. Uh, there are also, uh, bats are also good flower pollinators, uh, so the bats are basically the equivalent, the, the nocturnal night, uh, nighttime equivalent of uh, hummingbirds that in the daytime, so bats will pollinate flowers at night. Uh, and also um, they control uh, insect populations. Uh, so uh, uh, all eight of the species that are found in Ontario, they're all insect eating bats, uh, so a lot of them will eat, uh, you can sort of make out a moth here, um, so a lot of the caterpillars do damage uh, to the leaves of a lot of agricultural crops, uh, such as corn and soybean. Uh, so uh, people have done studies and found out that bats have like, you know, multi-billion dollar impact uh, on the economy. Um, so basically bats are doing what we call free ecosystem services uh, by providing free pest control uh, for a lot of these agricultural crops uh, that, you know, obviously are worth a lot of money. Um, so just recently, uh, three of these species, because of um, a disease called white nose syndrome, uh, has impacted uh, the populations of three of the species uh, enough that uh, they were put on the endangered species list in both Canada and the U.S. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, what we want to do is, uh, you know, we need to, you know, study the bats more to find out, uh, you know, how they fit in the ecosystem. Uh, okay, so now let's uh, look, uh, zero in on uh, the bat tissue samples that we have here. Uh, so this is looking at, uh, so, uh, so bats are, uh, are unique in that they're, they're, they're the only flying uh, 
uh, group of mammals. Uh, so that's at the taxonomic order, uh, taxonomic rank of order. Uh, so the next um, sort of uh, category rank is family. So of the 21 uh, family families of bats uh, in our tissue collection uh, at the ROM, we have uh, 15 of those 21 species uh, covered. Uh, when we look at the genus, um, the, uh, so we have about 120 uh, of the 220 uh, genera that are found. Uh, but you know, when we start getting down to species level, um, uh, we only have uh, 400 of the, you know, 1,400 plus uh, species of uh, bats that are found throughout the world. Um, so that, that just sort of highlights the fact that, um, you know, that uh, we, you know, we do know uh, information about bats, but we, there's still a lot of information we don't know that we still need to study. Um, so one of the uh, uh, sort of groups that I'm working with, this is called the, the Bat 1K Project. Uh, so basically the, the goal is to, um, to uh, sequence the genomes of, of all 1,400, uh, 1400 species uh, of bats. Uh, so a pilot project was done uh, a few years back, just before the pandemic started. Uh, uh, but the first phase uh, is getting one species uh, from each of the 21 families. Uh, so that is during uh, completion. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go on to uh, the second phase, uh, getting one species example from each of the uh, about 220 uh, genera of bats. Um, but there are also some side projects. Uh, so the project that I'll be talking about uh, is primarily associated with um, uh, looking at the immune, the immune system of COVID-19, related to COVID-19. Uh, so uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, but this is an um, international project that involves uh, researchers from throughout the world. Uh, so myself and Michael uh, are part of that project, um, but there's, uh, you know, literally, you know, a hundred more uh, researchers, collaborators on, on this bigger project um, uh, called the BAT1K uh, project. Uh, yeah, so this is an example of, um, yeah, so we talk about frozen tissues, um, but the key is that uh, the tissues need to be frozen uh, in liquid nitrogen. Uh, so liquid nitrogen is... Uh, super cold, so it's minus 196 degrees Celsius. Uh, so that's, uh, some people might remember that classic example, I can't remember which commercial it was, but you know, they dropped a rose into uh, liquid nitrogen, they picked it up and just sort of flicked it with their finger and the whole rose just shattered. Uh, so basically that's quick freezing. Uh, so that um, uh, preserves the DNA structure as best as possible. Uh, so that is what's very, very important. Um, uh, very few uh, museums or institutions um, have their DNA, their tissue samples, uh, frozen in liquid nitrogen. Uh, a lot of them uh, started uh, preserving it in ethanol, um, but that only preserves very, uh, very small fragments of DNA. Uh, so the, uh, some of the uh, genomic studies I'll be talking to you about today, uh, so the bat genomes um, have about two billion base pairs. Um, so a lot of the, the studies of sequencing the genome, uh, sequencing it uh, is not a problem, um, but a lot of times you only get very, very small fragments of maybe 50 to 100 base pairs. So obviously that's a very small chunk of 2 billion base pairs. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, the ROM uh, DNA technician, uh, Oliver Hadrath, uh, I, I love the way he, he says that, it's like you know, trying to put together the world's worst jigsaw puzzle because have all these little fragments, uh, but you don't know exactly you know, what order they go in. Um, but by saving it in liquid nitrogen, we can uh, recover larger chunks of DNA, so we can actually sort of layer them or scaffold them uh, to get a better idea of how they get assembled and in what order they come in. Uh, so the key uh, and what makes our uh, frozen tissues at the ROM very valuable is that uh, they've all been uh, frozen in liquid nitrogen in the field. Okay, so this uh, gives, gives you a bit of um, a history or, um, of how we've, uh, so basically this liquid uh, frozen tissue collection started uh, in 1989. So basically over the last 30, uh, 30 years or so, um, we have uh, accumulated about 400 uh, species of bats um, and about 14,000 uh, tissue samples of bats. 
Uh, and um, Valerie mentioned uh, that I've done field work in about 30 countries. Um, so uh, it covers a good chunk of, of the world, but I've, uh, obviously I'm missing a few places. So uh, obviously Africa uh, and Australia are two uh, sort of major continents uh, that are sort of missing. So again, just to highlight the fact that, you know, there's still a lot of work, you know, that needs to be done. And, and this, is, this is where that BAT1K uh, consortium comes into play. We, we need other uh, researchers, collaborators to help us uh, uh, to accumulate or, or get to the goal of uh, getting the genomes of all of these uh, different species of bats. Uh, so one example uh, I'll highlight here is um, I'm, I'm trying to start up a field work uh, project uh, in Sri Lanka, so just uh, off the uh, southern coast of India. Um, yeah, so most of my places are in tropical uh, areas where uh, most of the species diversity is found. So in general, for most groups, not just mammals, but uh, most groups of animals, organisms, um, the further away you get from the equator, the closer you get to the poles, uh, the biodiversity drops off. Uh, so, uh, so a lot of work is done in tropical places because that's where a lot of the species are found. Uh, so I'm going to just uh, show you this uh, one minute uh, video clip here, uh, just uh, that gives you um, uh, sort of a feel for what uh, field work uh, is like. Uh, so this is just the one, one minute clip here. Big uh, shout out to the uh, Environmental Visual Communications Program. Uh, so uh, Deb had mentioned uh, that they're working on, I think, a, a documentary uh, for John. Um, yeah, so uh, it was two uh, of the graduates from that EVC program, which is a, a joint venture between uh, ROM and uh, Fleming College. Uh, so, um, so back in 2015, uh, they went on the field trip uh, uh, documented uh, the work that we're doing uh, and, and put together uh, several different things that you can find on the ROM website, uh, including uh, this particular video. Uh, and, and just also to mention that uh, that when, when, uh, when John and Deb were giving their presentation, uh, th there's a couple of connections I didn't know about. So, uh, so apparently uh, John had gone to Western, so Connor, uh, my... Uh, uh, one of my co-authors of this paper, uh, he's at Western, uh, and then uh, John had mentioned that he had a connection also with uh, Fleming College, and the EBC program is with Fleming College. So th there's a lot of interconnections between uh, some of the work that we're doing and also uh, some of the stuff that, uh, that John and Deb had, uh, had, had presented on as well earlier today. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, so originally we, we didn't, uh, so this goes back 30 years before, you know, we even had the technology to even, you know, think about sequencing the genome. Um, you know, 30 years ago, you know, we were, you know, we were lucky to get 500 base pairs of DNA sequence, you know, let alone 2 billion base pairs. Uh, so uh, initially, the, the frozen tissues were being uh, collected for um, looking at the biodiversity, uh, but also the evolutionary history of bats in general, uh, specifically, but uh, mammals in general, uh, and basically all of the other uh, sort of life science departments uh, at the ROM uh, also do something similar. Uh, mo most uh, curators here would be uh, studying uh, uh, the DNA uh, in their particular group. Uh, so th this is just one example of uh, we're looking at, you know, how these different, uh, uh, different species of uh, bats are related to each other and where they're found uh, in Central and South America. Um, but during that process of finding the evolutionary relationships of these groups, uh, we also found out you know, that there are some uh, things uh, that you know, were unknown. Uh, so, uh, so also along the way, we've um, d described uh, several uh, species new to science. Um, so, so that's another um, sort of aspect of the work that, uh, that we do at the museum is to uh, 
to document uh, biodiversity, uh, but, but also to describe uh, new species that uh, are not previously known to science. Okay, so now let's um, get into uh, the collaborative research um, that we've been doing uh, uh, with uh, Western University uh, and also the uh, Senckenberg uh, Research Institute in Germany. Uh, so again, this happened uh, during um, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. So, you know, uh, I'm going to take you back in, in, into time uh, so everybody remembers working from home. Um, yeah, so this was a uh, project. Um, yeah, so people obviously, uh, so, so SARS-CoV-2 that has caused uh, COVID-19 was related to the original SARS, you know, from 20 years ago. Uh, that also impacted uh, Toronto um, heavily back then. Um, so, so we, we already knew that the natural reservoir, uh, one of the natural reservoirs uh, of, the, of a lot of uh, SARS, uh, 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 like coronaviruses, are found in bats. Um, but uh, the interesting thing is that bats, um, they appear healthy, they, they seem fine. So the, the question is, you know, why do they have such a large uh, viral load uh, that doesn't seem to affect them? Um, so, uh, so we were thinking about you know, we should uh, you know look at it from a genomic perspective. But of course, uh, during the pandemic, international travel, everything was locked down, so nobody could actually travel, you know, to Asia where these particular uh, groups of bats, horseshoe bats, uh, are found. Um, so, uh, so just coincidentally, um, I had done work in that uh, part of uh, southern China, but but also Southeast Asia in general. Uh, so we actually had frozen tissues uh, of a lot of these uh, species of bats uh, that are considered the reservoir of uh, these uh, coronaviruses. Uh, so so we, uh, we were already talking about sequencing the genomes of the bats, um, but then uh, we also had a contact uh, at Western University, so some virologists there, including uh, Connor, who will be up here uh, doing the panel discussion. Um, so we actually wanted to look at it from both ends, not only, um, you know, from the bat genome, you know, so why do the bats, uh, how are the bats able to survive with so many viruses, uh, but we also wanted to look at it from the virus end of it. Uh, what kind of viruses uh, do bats have uh, as well? Um, and the, the, the last thing I want to mention here is that, and I, I'll show it uh, in a second in the next slide, uh, is that... Um, the bat uh, coronaviruses are uh, quite different from the uh, virus that caused COVID-19. Uh, so uh, they've always gone through an intermediate host, uh, and that intermediate host um, uh, for the original SARS two decades ago, uh, that was considered to be um, like a civet, so sort of like a mongoose uh, animal. Uh, for the current uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it was thought at one point it was a pangolin, uh, but even the pangolin has enough differences uh, uh, in its genome uh, that uh, it wasn't an exact match uh, that you know, caused the COVID-19 uh, disease. Uh, so again, uh, still a, a lot of research that uh, needs to be done to figure out exactly what's going on here. Uh, yeah, so just um, hopefully very quickly, uh, just a bit of background information. Um, uh, so here is... Um, the, uh, the, uh, the human SARS that has caused COVID-19. Um, and here is the bats. So uh, the closest uh, coronavirus related to, uh, to the coronavirus that's found in humans is bats. But there's a 4% difference in the RNA sequences um, uh, between the bat uh, and the human uh, coronaviruses. Uh, so you know, 4% might not sound like a lot, uh, to put it in perspective, um, uh, the closest living relative to humans is chimpanzee, uh, and looking at the DNA genome, uh, there's uh, only a 5% difference uh, between humans and chimpanzees. Uh, so this 4% uh, actually is, uh, is, is significant uh, between uh, the uh, coronaviruses between humans uh, and bats. Uh, so that, that's where that intermediate host, uh, so we still don't know what the intermediate host, so the intermediate host uh, should have an even closer um, uh, sequence uh, to the human uh, coronavirus, uh, but, we, 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 but we still don't uh, know that uh, as yet. 
Okay, so, um, so uh, the virologists at Western, um, through a contact, uh, through a, a Ram research associate, uh, who is a, a professor emeritus at Western. So he said, hey, you know, you know the ROM has, you know, this frozen tissue collection. Uh, and uh, so the virologists um, said, oh, well, that's interesting. Uh, so they, um, so, uh, so they uh, decided to, you know, come and sample our collections. Uh, so in general, um, so what they're interested in is that from Southeast Asia, uh, which is, uh, basically where uh, the, a lot of these coronaviruses have originated. Uh, so we basically have collected, uh, you know, for uh, over a 20-year time period. Uh, and we had about 900 specimens, uh, you know, frozen samples of these bats, uh, representing about 100 different species of bats. Uh, so basically, um, uh, uh, our collaborators at Western, they, they wanted to uh, sample uh, you know, these specimens to find out, you know, what viruses uh, were found in there. Uh, yeah, so basically, um, they're looking at coronaviruses in general, uh, so not just the ones that um, caused uh, COVID-19. Um, so again, um, the idea was, uh, so, so if they found any um, uh, viruses, uh, they would sequence uh, the RNA uh, of those viruses. Uh, and... Um, and a very important part of it uh, was the spike uh, genes, the spike proteins. Uh, that, that's how uh, they enter the human cell, uh, is the spike proteins match up. That allows them to enter the cells. Uh, so the, the, the virus that comes from whatever animal source, uh, if the spike protein matches up, uh, it can enter the cell of the humans, and, and that's when um, the person gets infected. Uh, so the spike uh, gene is a very important part uh, uh, of uh, the coronavirus. Uh, and then the, the goal was uh, to, to develop vaccines uh, for um, these coronaviruses uh, because we know that the next um, coronavirus uh, or the next viral uh, pandemic, it will be something different. It won't be, you know, the COVID-19 uh, disease. It'll be something different, but at least uh, we'll have uh, like a broad array of different vaccines so we can zero in, okay, well, this vaccine matches closest uh, this current um, outbreak. Uh, so this way, if we can um, uh, get a better designed vaccine, uh, so hopefully, you know, the, the outbreak is only localized. It doesn't, you know, become, you know, throughout the world like, you know, COVID-19 beca uh, became. Um, and um, so just at, even at the initial stage, uh, people uh, were getting excited. Uh, so we got quite a bit of coverage. So uh, like uh, CBC covered it, uh, CTV, uh, also uh, there was uh, newsprint uh, newspapers were covering it. Um, yeah, so again, you know, this is, you know, back, you know, uh, 2020, 2021. Um, yeah, so, uh, so again, um, so that's Connor uh, on, the, on the left there and a couple of students uh, from uh, Western that were helping him. Uh, so again, uh, this is uh, the fall of 2020, so we're still in full lockdown mode, you know, still working from home, uh, so I had to get special permission uh, to come into uh, the museum uh, uh, and to, uh, uh, to get uh, Connor uh, and his crew uh, to sample, you know, all those 900, you know, plus specimens. Um, yeah, so... Um, We'll, we'll talk a little bit more. I can't get into all the details of the analysis and stuff like that, but uh, we can talk a little bit more about it uh, during the panel discussion. Um, so um, the interesting part is that they actually found this other type of virus called uh, par uh, paramyxoviruses. Uh, so these are um, viruses that are related to things like uh, measles and mumps. Um, so, uh, so these are found in humans. Um, but there are also bat-related uh, uh, paramyxoviruses. Um, uh, you may not have heard of these ones, uh, Nipah and Hendra. Uh, so those are, con are, con are considered uh, zoonotic, so um, they are transmitted from animals. Uh, so Nipah and Hendra uh, are considered, uh, so again, bats are the natural reservoir of, of these two types of viruses uh, that can cause um, uh, sickness in humans. Uh, so again, those are very important um, uh, health-related uh, um, uh, uh, viruses uh, that, um, that we need to, uh, you know, find out more about. 
uh, yeah, so what we, what we found was that um, we uh, didn't really know, you know, what the diversity of these uh, paramyxoviruses are. So to give you an example of that, um, so this is the, the study. So this is based on a, um, a presentation that uh, Connor gave uh, at a conference last year. Uh, so basically, uh, of all those samples we uh, talked about earlier, uh, so we got 641 individuals from seven families, 19 genera of bats uh, tested. So, uh, so this is where they come from, you know, basically Southeast Asia. Uh, so uh, he found that uh, about 3.6% uh, of those tissue samples uh, tested positive uh, for a paramyxovirus. Uh, and um, so again, that doesn't sound too high, but, but that is on par with uh, other studies that other people have done for other bats. Uh, so that just uh, indicates that, you know, what we're getting is not, uh, is within the normal realms. Um, uh, and just a, a little bit more detail is that uh, picture here of the bent wing bat. Uh, so that had the highest uh, positivity rate of 16.7%. Um, but the leaf nose bat um, had the, the highest number of uh, absolute samples, so, so 12 uh, of those uh, 641 ones that tested positive, um, uh, this particular uh, genus uh, had uh, the most positive uh, results for the paramyxovirus. Uh, okay, so now um, uh, just looking at uh, uh, basically this, this is a um, the evolutionary relationships of all of these, are, uh, of the paramyxoviruses that we know uh, currently, so all the ones that are in red. So basically, um, uh, 20 of the 23 sequences that were recovered uh, from the samples that were done, they're, they're all the ones in red. Um, um, so you can see that most of the, uh, the, vi uh, the, uh, the virus sequences um, were unknown, uh, that they were novel viruses. Uh, so that, so even though uh, the number of positives was quite low, um, the number of new viruses was actually quite high. Uh, and then in sort of this orange, so one big, uh, this orange uh, J long virus uh, in orange here. Um, so all of these new viruses were in this uh, orange group, except for the two down here, uh, which I'll talk about in one second. Uh, yeah, so one of them is the Hanipa virus, uh, so the one in blue over here, uh, so that is found in a fruit-eating bat. Uh, so that was a, a new sequence, so you can see, uh, so basically this sort of branch length, the longer it is, the more different it is to everything else. So when you have something like this, basically these two viruses here are almost exactly identical, uh, whereas this one is quite different from everything else in this particular group. Uh, and uh, I guess one of the more surprising ones is that in this uh, group of nectar feeding bats, uh, that this one was like, you know, way out in left field here, way on its own. So that was um, something, you know, totally new, not only new, but also quite different. Um, so I, I, I think uh, Connor uh, uh, is probably uh, working on actually sequencing that whole um, RNA sequence uh, for this particular virus. Uh, and um, one other uh, thing to mention is, uh, oh yeah, and then the other thing is that, um, that sometimes, um, yeah, so this group here, uh, you probably can't see it that well, but uh, they're in that leaf nose uh, genus, uh, Hipposideris. Um, but there's just one uh, species uh, in Minneopters that actually is in this other group. Uh, so that sort of uh, indicates that there might be um, uh, viruses uh, that are jumping between a different bat hosts, uh, so that can also, um, you know, cause uh, some confusion over, you know, uh, what the host uh, of these different uh, uh, viruses are. Uh, and then the last uh, point uh, I'll identify here is that, um, uh, oh yeah, so so this group here of the leaf nose bats, uh, so so this is actually the the genus where uh, the coronaviruses uh, are considered a natural reservoir. Uh, so they, they're actually um, uh, the viruses found uh, in this genus. They all group together, so uh, they're, they're not found in these other groups. Uh, so this is a group uh, that contains only uh, the viruses for this particular genus of bat. 
Uh, oh, and then and the last part uh, that you can't just sort of fell off the screen here. Um, uh, so I, I had mentioned it earlier that, again, that bats have all of these viruses, um, but they're healthy. Uh, but the problem is that when uh, some of these uh, viruses or viruses that are similar, when they uh, get uh, transmitted uh, or passed on to humans, um, uh, but most of the times, you know, you know, we, we fight it off, but there are some viruses um, uh, that make us sick, and some of them are, you know, deadly, uh, like the COVID-19. Okay, so, so that was uh, sort of the viral uh, part of the research that we're doing uh, during uh, the pandemic research. Uh, so the other end uh, is now looking at the genome of the bats, uh, so the host of a lot of these viruses. Um, yeah, so, uh, so just a quick summary of uh, some of the results that we got back. Uh, so, uh, so when we're looking at uh, rodents, um, so rodents have like 1.4% um, of uh, the viruses recovered from rodents. 1.4% uh, were, um, were viruses of, uh, of interest. Uh, but for bats, uh, there's a big chunk, 17.8%, uh, uh, are actually uh, the coronavirus uh, type. Uh, uh, viruses. Uh, and then uh, when we zero in on these coronaviruses, we find, uh, so again, um, I had mentioned it uh, briefly before, so the, the two families are the horseshoe family, so it's noted by uh, sort of this uh, sort of weird looking uh, appendage on their face that helps their echolocation when they're flying around at night, but it has sort of this horseshoe shape at the, at the base, uh, so that's where that common name comes from. Uh, so, like 41% uh, of the coronaviruses uh, have been found uh, in this family, uh, and then the, the leaf nose family, uh, they're also high at 31%, uh, but then the, the other families of bats, um, they're not as high as that. Uh, okay, so now looking at um, uh, some of the uh, genes, or the genomes, um, so again, uh, so these are uh, some of, so the ones in red are the samples that came from the ROM uh, that were sequenced for the genome uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in Germany, uh, so related to the lab that Michael was in. Uh, so the ones in black are ones that had been done uh, previously. Um, uh, yeah, so basically the, the colors, uh, so the purple here, uh, so those are basically intact functional genes uh, the ones in sort of uh, orange or red on the right-hand side, uh, those are genes that have been inactivated by mutation, but, but they're still, you know, the, we, we still know that uh, they are those particular genes. Uh, and then the ones in gray here are the ones that uh, are missing or incomplete, so we, we, we couldn't recover the full uh, genomes, the, the full DNA of the sequences, um, so they, they represented a little sliver. Uh, but when you compare it uh, to some of the other samples uh, from uh, short reads, we can see that, um, that the genomic sequencing that we were doing, um, the quality uh, was a lot better. Uh, so that uh, is related um, uh, to what I mentioned before, was that it was the, um, you know, the uh, freezing in liquid nitrogen in the field. Uh, so that retains um, larger chunks. So, so basically that's what the long read genomes are. Uh, so they uh, allow bigger chunks to be scaffolded for you, be, for you to be able to find out, you know, where all of or most of the genes are. So there's only a few uh, missing parts of the genome, whereas when you have the short reads, so, you, so those are the, you know, the 50 to 100 base pairs, you can see that there's, you know, with that technology, there's big chunks. So you can sequence the genome, you just don't know what order they go in. So that's where you get this big gray area. Uh, so just to say that, um, uh, the, the key to a lot of this genomic research uh, that we're doing is based on the fact that, you know, we're saving uh, our tissue samples in liquid nitrogen. Uh, and the, the other part uh, I didn't mention was that um, uh, liquid nitrogen is not always that easy to get. Uh, so the different countries, um, uh, I've managed uh, to find it, but sometimes um, it's a little bit tricky to find it. Uh, sometimes it's tricky to get it into the field because you've got to, you know, lug this tank around. Um, uh, but I think that is uh, one of the key aspects that ha has made uh, the ROM collections um, so valuable and important is because of this, uh, this crucial step uh, in the field work that we do, freezing it in liquid nitrogen. 
Uh, okay, so just a little bit more uh, summary of um, uh, the genomic work we did. So again, th these are um, the uh, 10 uh, new genomes that we uh, included in. So we were concentrating primarily uh, for the COVID study. So we had a lot of these uh, horseshoe bats uh, and also the, their closest relative, the closest family uh, in the leaf nose bats. Uh, but then we also sampled some uh, ones uh, in other groups. Uh, so basically, you know, we wanted to make sure that you know, the data that we're getting from our genome data uh, you know, was corroborated by other earlier studies. Uh, and basically, you know, this type of evolutionary tree branching program, uh, uh, pattern uh, matches up with what, what other people have done using other data sets. Uh, so, that, so that was good to know. Uh, so this is based on about uh, 13, uh, or sorry, uh, 17,000 uh, genes, uh, and it agreed with pre uh, previous studies. Uh, so we also uh, time calibrated um, uh, the, uh, the branching uh, pattern. So we also wanted to know, you know, how, how far back in time uh, to do these uh, relationships occur. Uh, so for uh, the relationship between these two families that are related, uh, associated with uh, uh, SARS coronaviruses. Uh, so it goes back to about uh, 35 million years. Uh, so these groups of bats are, are a fairly old uh, group of bats. Uh, and um, yeah, so, so basically, uh, so we, if you get back to the immune system, um, so, so the bats uh, seem to be healthy. Uh, so basically that indicates that, you know, there's been a long evolutionary, uh, co-evolutionary uh, process between, you know, the bats uh, and the viruses, the hosts and the viruses uh, that, you know, have gotten, you know, the immune systems that the bats do have. Uh, and so one, one of the things we want to look at, we want to look at, um, you, know, uh, you know, what positive selection, which, which genes are under positive selection uh, that signals uh, some type of evolutionary adaptation. So, so you know, why bats uh, seem to tolerate uh, all of these viruses. Uh, so, uh, so we want to look for positive selection in some of the genes. Uh, so these are some of the studies. So, so we looked at uh, 10 different uh, orders or groups of mammals. Uh, so again, basically elephants, primates, rodents, et cetera, uh, down to bats on, on the right-hand side. Uh, so we found that there was strong selection uh, in bats for the immune system processes. So bats, uh, for this particular um, type of gene, uh, it was the highest, and rodents uh, were also very high. Uh, you can see that there's, there's other um, very high positive selection in other groups for other types of um, uh, processes, but, the, but, the, but these aren't you know, related to the immune, immune system. So the ones that we're interested in uh, are these ones here with the, uh, the immune system process. Uh, and uh, so we looked at the data a little bit more closely. So this is just looking at uh, the branch length uh, compared uh, to the amount of positive selection. Uh, so the, there is a relationship. So the longer the branch, which means that the longer uh, evolutionary time uh, is co positively correlated with uh, how much positive selection there is with genes. So th there is a positive uh, correlation, which is uh, this uh, linear regression. Um, but you can see uh, the bat, bat branches are in red, so there are a lot clustered uh, along that regression line, but there's a lot that are at sort of the extreme, way above here, uh, but there's not that many red dots uh, below here, so this indicates that um, uh, there's a lot more selection on immune genes going on in bats than there are in other mammals. Uh, and then this, the, the one last piece is uh, the blue dot here, uh, so basically, it's, it's called the ancestral branches, but it's almost like the average for bats. So you can see that uh, uh, the uh, scientific uh, name for the order of bats is Chiroptera. So Chiro is hand, uh, Terra is wing. Uh, so you can see that uh, basically sort of the average bat, um, uh, positive selection is actually quite high, so quite far away from this linear regression uh, line here. Uh, so suggesting that uh, bats uh, have a lot of positive selection uh, for immune genes. Uh, oh, and, and uh, there's just the bat, uh, the, sort of the average or ancestral bat is there. Uh, and so, so, we, uh, so 
Um, but obviously, you know, one gene doesn't control the whole immune system. There's a lot of different genes. Of, of those 17,000 genes, a lot of those genes are involved. So just not one gene that looks after the immune system or any other, uh, you know, particular um, uh, aspect uh, in, in the species. Uh, so let's just look at uh, some of these immune genes uh, a little bit more closely. Um, yeah, so... So again, the immune system processes. So, so there are sort of um, uh, seven main groups here, uh, but even within these seven main groups, um, so the ones with the arrow and the E, so we, we've looked at uh, more specifically some of the genes within these gene groups. Uh, and, and, and basically what you see is that um, for bats, again, for all of these different immune-related genes, uh, uh, the bats indicate uh, that they're they have uh, a lot higher positive selection for these immune genes compared to, you know, most of the other uh, mammals uh, that were uh, that were in the study. Uh, so basically, what, what this is telling us um, is that uh, so we think that you know bats have evolved uh, a tolerance uh, to these viruses. Uh, so that was sort of the adaptation. Uh, so that's different from uh, what we call resistance. Uh, so a lot of times. Um, uh, you know, for humans, um, like inflammation uh, is uh, one of the major ways that we fight off disease. Uh, uh, so basically, we're, we're trying to stop, you know, this, um, you know, this virus or this pathogen uh, that's in our, in our body. Uh, whereas bats, they, they seem to, they, you know, they, they, they allow a lot of these, you know, viruses, pathogens to enter the body uh, and they just live with them. Whereas other groups of animals, like uh, humans, uh, you know, uh, we don't want them in the body, so we keep trying to resist them. Uh, so bats have actually um, uh, come up with a uh, different uh, way to com combat diseases uh, than humans have. Um, yeah, um, but the other important thing I want to say is that, um, so bats, basically they tolerate, uh, but they, they, uh, bats also... Um, uh, use inflammation uh, as, as, as a response uh, to uh, pathogens or diseases. It's just not at the extreme level uh, that humans do. Uh, yeah, so, so, you know, humans, you know, when, when we have infection, um, you, know, you know, like people that might be allergic to, uh, to nuts, um, you know, they'll start swelling up. Uh, yeah, so most of the times, you know, it's like a minor swelling, and then over time it dissipates because your body has fought it off. Other times... Um, your body overreacts to the point where, um, you know, you have trouble breathing, you, know, you have to go to the hospital. Uh, so sometimes uh, that uh, inflammation response, uh, you know, sometimes goes overboard. Uh, so that's sort of a, a negative aspect of sort of the, the resistance of pathogens, uh, is that sometimes um, when, the, when the, the body overreacts, uh, sometimes that, you know, can be fatal. Uh, so that's a little, an, another difference between being resistant to pathogens or being tolerant of uh, pathogens. Uh, okay, so uh, just in summary, um, some of the, uh, the take-home messages uh, that, uh, uh, that I hope uh, you get out of this um, uh, is that uh, bats uh, you know, never uh, transmitted uh, any of the SARS-like coronaviruses directly uh, to humans. It was always uh, some type of inter intermediate host. Um, so that is related, um, there was a lot of talk about uh, like wet markets or live markets. Um, so a lot of times, you know, animals are brought together uh, unnaturally uh, and in very closed, confined spaces. Uh, so that's where a lot of these viruses, you know, can jump around. Uh, so that's why it's always hard to trace, you know, what was the intermediate host uh, that eventually, you know, that virus from that particular animal jumped to humans uh, that were in that market. Uh, so, so that's another unknown. Um, so this is related to a sort of encroachment on natural habitats is that, you know, with, you know, more development, we're getting closer, you know, to wildlife. Um, but also sometimes we're bringing wildlife, you know, unnaturally together uh, in um, situations such as, you know, live markets or wet markets. Uh, so that can also cause uh, a lot of, you know, trans accidental transmission. Uh, and as I mentioned before, um, you know, bats, uh, they're healthy, so they don't, um, they don't show signs of uh, illness, uh, such as, you know, we would with a lot of uh, the, dis the diseases, viruses. Um, 
And um, so it's very important that, um, so one of the things we want to do is look at uh, what differences um, our, uh, uh, the bat's immune system has and then compare it uh, to uh, the human immune system, the genes, uh, to find out uh, whether you know, we can come up you know, with uh, things to uh, help you know, during um, a future outbreak uh, of some pathogen. Uh, and uh, uh, Connor might talk a little bit more about it uh, during the panel discussion. Uh, so, uh, and I mentioned it sort of briefly, is that the idea is to um, uh, build up a vaccine bank uh, that will allow us uh, basically to uh, more quickly develop, you know, vaccines because um, it, it, it did take a while, you know, uh, for us to come up with the first vaccine for COVID-19. In fact, I think we're on like like the the fourth or fifth different vaccine. Uh, so, you know, the viruses, uh, they're also evolving, you know, uh, you know to uh, our defenses uh, from, from a medical vaccine perspective. Um, so the, the, the wider or the, the broader the vaccine bank, uh, hopefully the quicker we can zero in on uh, which, you know, vaccine will work best for whatever, um, you know, coronavirus comes up uh, in the future. Uh, okay, so there were, there were a lot of um, uh, different funding sources, and um, so we had a lot of help from each of our three institutions, uh, but the major funding uh, for my work, for a lot of the field work, came from the ROM governors at, uh, here at the museum. Uh, so um, a lot of the funding uh, for uh, Connor's uh, virus stuff came from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, uh, and then uh, Mike Michael's uh, genomics uh, lab uh, got uh, primary funding from the uh, German Research uh, Foundation. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, so now we're going to go into sort of the second phase. So if I can call Connor up here uh, for a panel discussion, and I think uh, Michael will be hopefully uh, coming in virtually. You got a microphone there? Thank you, uh, So this is Connor. <laughs> um, do you want to give, your, uh, give a quick introduction? Uh, Valerie had mentioned a little bit about yourself, but uh, who you are, where you're from. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Connor. Uh, I'm just a PhD candidate, not a, a PhD yet, so working that way. Um, I'm a technically a, like a molecular virologist, so I study primarily, like Burton talked about, novel virus discovery, so looking at different, identifying different coronaviruses or different paramyx of viruses. Um, and then also really trying, like, like Burton mentioned about the spike gene, is really trying to understand what mediates viral entry within the spike protein. So is it the entire spike? Is it just uh, smaller sections of the spike that we can, say, manipulate to allow viruses to enter? Um, and doing this all in a very safe way, um, not any live replicating viruses in a very um, limited system, but just looking at are these viruses or are these changes in the spikes able to mediate viral entry, um, and then using that information for that, that seed bank that, that you had discussed. Okay, so, great. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we have Michael uh, on the, the big screen here, Michael. The thing is, uh, Michael can't see us, but, he, uh, uh, but we can see him. <laughs> Uh, you, you can hear us okay, Michael? I can hear you well, yeah. Okay, um, good. So thanks. Uh, okay, thanks take, for, yeah, if, if you give a quick intro of, of yourself. Trying to do that. Okay, yeah, thanks for inviting me, and uh, thanks, Burton, for a really fantastic talk. Um, so I'm Michael Hiller, Professor of Comparative Genomics, um, based in Germany in Frankfurt, so meaning for us it's now past 10 p.m., <laughs> a little late on the evening. Um, I'm a computational biologist, um, and we are, my lab, what, essentially trying to find the genomic underpinnings of uh, phenotypic differences and adaptations um, between species. And bats is one of our um, focal area. And I should say that um, we are typically on the receiving end of getting samples from collaborators like Burton. And therefore, um, it was great for me in a way to see photos and videos of the sampling process during, during his talk. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Connor, uh, for the, uh, with the first question. Um, so, so we know the scientific process. Uh, you know, we, we have a project we want to do, and we have objectives or goals or hypotheses uh, that we want to get out of the data. 
Uh, but sometimes they, the O's don't work out, so sometimes you know we, you got to pivot or change. Uh, so as I mentioned uh, before the pandemic, you know, we were looking you know uh, for the virus that was causing COVID-19 uh, coronaviruses, but uh, so the, the stuff that I summarized from your talk was actually not coronavirus; it was something else. Uh, so can you give us a, a, a sort of a quick summary of um, how you had to sort of change uh, change your uh, plan of attack uh, as you started getting the data back and, and, and what, what happened? Sure. <laughs> um, so after we had collected, I think, nearly a thousand samples, um, which was uh, every Friday in the summer, me and my, my small team of undergrads would drive up to 403 from London, sit in the basement for eight hours, listening to the hum of a nice minus 80, cutting up tissues, taking them back to London, um, and then trying to screen those tissues for the presence of coronaviruses. Um, and over the course of, I, I would think, three or four months, we had screened about 1,000 samples, and we hadn't found a single hit. Um, and in our mind, that doesn't necessarily tell us that those bats weren't infected. It just tells us that the samples or the tissues that we were screening were probably negative or the viruses, coronaviruses specifically, were not infecting those tissues. So we were screening spleens and kidneys. Um, so our data or our negative data for coronaviruses tells us that in bats you will not find coronaviruses in spleens or kidneys. So then that's when we thought, we still have all these tissues, we should make use of all of the, the research and the time and the effort that we've all put in. So we looked into literature and, and thought, what viruses have been previously described in or to be found in spleens and kidneys? And one of those was paramyxoviruses, um, which obviously have, I, I would say, pretty fair public health relevance with measles, mumps, and then also the, the zoonotic Nipah and Hendra. So that's where we had all of the RNA extracted. Um, so it was just a matter of applying different screening methods to a lot of the work that we had already done. And then we ended up finding around 23 samples, 20 of which were novel, and a couple of very interesting ones that we're still working on. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was a great pivot to that. OK, well, <laughs> the original idea didn't work out, but there was something else of, of interest. So, so I thought that, that was a great uh, result, um, nonetheless. Um, so, uh, Michael, uh, for you, um, so I, I know in your lab you study a lot of other groups of animals, birds, et cetera, so not just bats. Uh, but for this particular uh, bat study, uh, was there anything um, of interest from a genomic perspective that uh, you thought might, uh, was, was unexpected or surprising uh, from your, your, your perspective uh, in, in this bat uh, study? There was certainly um, something for me rather unexpected um, when it came to the experiments that um, collaborators did. Um, and, and that, um, yeah, I guess it was something I, I certainly wasn't expecting. And it's essentially that um, just with hin bats um, and even closely related species, there we have now some evidence that um, immune responses can be quite different. Um, this in a way fits with the overarching picture that the immune system is very rapidly evolving because species need to, or the immune system of species needs to constantly adapt to the viruses that it encounters. Um, so, so Burton, you showed in the talk, right, these, these heat maps where we group bats as uh, in one category, so all bats go in one group. And this is very useful if you want to compare um, bats to other mammals, which is what we started out with. But we also looked... Um, into, into these, the, the species we had sequence, uh, sequenced. And there we found a lot of um, diversity at the level of genes. And so one of these genes, ISG15, is um, so a key gene also implicated in uh, severe COVID-19. And collaborators did um, experiments with those. And so essentially asking um, if we put that gene from different um, horseshoe bats into cells and then infect them with a virus. And how well are these cells doing? And what I found, I should say, almost say shocking, <laughs> is that sometimes even closely related species um, have a very different antiviral response. Um, you should take this maybe with a grain of salt because those are cellular so cells in a dish at the organismal level could be different. But nevertheless, I think it highlights that there is a lot of diversity at the immune system level just within bats. And that means if we want to, you know, comprehensively understand how the immune system of bats um, works, there's probably a, a lot of work to be done because we cannot just focus on two bats and then we understand them all. There is a large diversity that we have to tackle. Yeah, I think somebody had sort of mentioned um, 
<clears throat> sort of like an evolutionary uh, arms war is that, you know, uh, exactly. you know we're, we're trying to, you know, combat them, stop them with their defenses, but then, you know, these viruses, um, they actually evolve, you know, quite rapidly as we found out with, you know, COVID-19. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a moving target, which makes it, you know, that much more challenging uh, as well. Uh, okay, so um, another question for you, uh, Connor, is that, um, uh, <clears throat> so uh, we have more than just bat tissues <laughs> at, at the ROM, uh, and not just more, and we, we have birds as well, but, um, so what um, are you planning on uh, doing, uh, expanding beyond uh, the bat stuff, uh, screening for uh, different viruses? Um, I, not for me, because obviously I, I, I have pretty limited time with the rest of my PhD, but I, I would hope that Ryan, who's my supervisor um, and in charge of the lab that I, I work in, I, I would hope that he has more plans, because it is really a gold mine in terms of, um, just even within the bats, I'll, I'll get to your question, but even within the bats is having these samples from 1993 and possibly being able to isolate virus from those because what we can do if we get viral genomes from 93 and, and possibly throughout the years, like all the way from say 89, all the way up to say 2013, I think is the most recent uh, set that we have, um, is that we can start to look at how are the viral genomes changing over that time and then get a better sense for say the viral evolution with regards to paramyxa viruses or um, possibly other viruses like e Ebola-like viruses. Um, but to answer your question about looking at other um, mammals, um, as you showed in the slide, I would, first one that would come to mind would probably be rodents. Um, just because of the amount of diversity within rodents, because if you have generally more host diversity, you'll have more viral diversity. Um, so I would say rodents, because they have a high amount of host diversity and they also have a high amount of viral diversity. Um, and then also because humans and agricultural animals and, and um, we interface with them so often and we're in such cl uh, close quarters with those, um, with that group, I think that would have the most relevance with, say, a, a, a zoonotic virus or a virus that could infect humans. It's yeah. most likely to come from, say, bats or, or rodents just because we're so close to them. Yeah, it is also that a very elusive intermediate host. Um, yes. Yeah, yes. so basically, you know, the more, uh, the more species that we can, you know, survey and screen for, um, hopefully uh, we'll be able to, you know, get a better handle on, you know, how, how these viruses are jumping from, you know, one species uh, to the next. Um, so, so uh, Michael, um, the next question for you, uh, looking at, um, yeah, so, so this particular talk was about, you know, immune systems, um, but again, I, I know you um, uh, have studied other uh, groups of bats. Um, is, is there uh, any uh, other uh, sort of adaptations uh, that you have worked on recently that uh, might rival uh, sort of the amazing, you know, immune system adaptation that bats have? Um. Yeah, bats have a have a number of fascinating traits, right? I mean, the only um, mammals that have powered flight, very sophisticated echolocation. Um, what we focus on in the lab when it comes to um, bats, in addition, of course, um, to studying immune system changes, is um, longevity and dietary um, adaptations or adaptations of highly specialized diets. So for the first, um, this is maybe something that's not as well known. Um, most bats live very long, especially given that they're rather small mammals, right? There's a, I think there's, um, there's, a, there's a statistic that always um, is so cool that I can remember this. There are 19 mammals that live um, proportionally to their body weight longer than humans, and 18 of those are bats. So we and others would like to know in a way how bats do they achieve these very long um, life and health spans. Um, with respect to diet, um, so you showed already in, in the talk, right, beautiful images of these um, nectar and the uh, um, fruit eating bats that essentially get a, have a diet that's very rich in sugar. Um, it's, it's similar to a Western diet, um, and, and these bats um, actually consume a lot of um, fruit juice and nectar, sometimes or often even um, exceeding their own body weight. And um, this is obviously a diet very different to the diet of most other bats that feed on insects. Another really cool example are the vampire bats that we have been now studying for a number of years. So the only mammals that feed exclusively on blood 
And blood, of course, also mostly fluid, but it contains um, pretty much no sugar and no fat, or very, very small amounts of it. And the only major nutrient that vampire bats get is actually protein. And uh, so thanks to um, you, Burton, and the, 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 the sample collection at Rome, we now have um, really high quality genomes of all three living vampire bat species. Um, also, many of these fruit and nectar feeders have now been sequenced, and there are many more that uh, were, were now, we and others are now targeting. And um, yeah, we're using these genomes to essentially understand the, uh, the genomic basis of these, um, of these adaptations to longevity and also these very specialized diets. Yeah, I, I agree fully that uh, bats are cool. I, 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 do, uh, I also do a little bit of work on uh, whales as well. So we also okay. uh, sequenced the, the blue whale genome, which is the biggest animal. Uh, and as Michael said, um, in general, uh, the big animals are the ones that are more long-lived, you know, like elephants, um, you know, humans as well. Uh, so usually the small things like, you know, a rat, you know, if they live one year, they're, they're pretty lucky. So bats are unusual. They're small, but they actually live a, a long time. So that's another thing that uh, we can sort of uh, get more, uh, hopefully get uh, closer to uh, maybe the fountain of youth in bats. Um, yeah, so I, I think we're probably over time. So I, I wanted to uh, save some time uh, for any questions from the audience. So I hope uh, people have had a chance to think of some great questions to ask us. Um, um, thank you so much. This was such an interesting talk. I'm curious about your views on the geopolitics of the research, because when I see things like a period between, um, I can't remember, if, you know, early 2000s to 2013, collecting some of those samples through Southeast Asia, going into other countries. Um, I saw Africa on the list. The world's changing so quickly, and the friendliness and the relationships between some of the countries that you were in and some of the ones that we might not be able to get in, um, those relationships have changed. And so I wonder about, you know, it's crazy to think about how quickly the coronavirus changed in humans between when it was in Italy to when it arrived in America. And I wonder how you think about the scientific community opening those doors. So if we would need or could go back to the wet markets or the caves in China and recollect those samples from those same places now to further watch that evolution. But how are you thinking about the geopolitics and the relationship and how that's either an impediment or a help to your studies? Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Very tough questions. I'll, I'll just a answer very quickly. I, I have a feeling uh, both Connor and Michael might have uh, some opinions on uh, some of that as well. Um, uh, yeah, it, it does change over time. Um, so when I did work in China um, that uh, uh, got a lot of these samples, um, yeah, so th there's a lot of paperwork, all the permits, um, but, you know, we have to get permits, you know, from the Canada and um, uh, but also permits, you know, from uh, from the uh, the Chinese end of things. Um, and, but of course, you know, during the pandemic, you know, you know, nobody, you know, could have gotten anything. Uh, so things, you know, do change, you know, with uh, how easy or difficult it is to get permits. Uh, but basically, um, you know, we have to do it, you know, by the books. Um, and so basically, uh, I always ask, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't care, you know, what hoops to jump through. You just tell me. How high to jump? Uh, so we, we and, and sometimes um, they're, they're just not possible. Um, so, but 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 basically, we, we have to follow all of the uh, the the uh, legal uh, permitting process to do, do all this work. I think uh, I think Connor wanted to sure. jump in there. <laughs> um, that's a great question, um, and I would say yes, geopolitics does certainly play a role. Um, but at least I feel within like the scientific community, it's very open. Um, in terms of like when they were first identifying COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 in China, like we were able to rapidly kind of adapt and that's why we had a vaccine within, you know, the better part of two years, which usually takes much, much longer. Um, so I, even within say governments fighting, I think within the science and kind of research community, I still think there's a sense of kind of unity. We're working together and, and we all want to, you know, we all want to work together to better 
everybody's life. So I think that's why you had scientists in China working with scientists in the US and, and all these different foreign uh, scientists and bodies all working together to work towards getting a vaccine so that everybody can use it, um, even between government squabbles. Uh, M Michael, did you want to comment on permits? Yeah, uh, so you, you have to get a lot of these you know, tissue samples you know, from around the world to your lab. Uh, did you want to comment on permits or, or not? <laughs> Not on permits, but uh, I completely second what uh, Connor just said, right? So the pandemic clearly showed that any of this is not a local problem, right? So um, a pandemic will never be, or any of these viral outbreaks, right? If they're really infectious in a way, they will not stay local. It will be a global problem. And the best um, mankind of researchers can do is um, collaborating and um, rapidly sharing results, right? And I think even if there are hurdles in a way with them, um, that that politics in a way make it hard for people to collaborate. Um, my feeling is also that between scientists this seems to work rather well. For example, one of our key collaborators in this um, in the, the project that Burton presented, right, is actually working in China. Yeah, but certainly if those hurdles could be lowered, um, that would make things even more efficient and effective. Hi. Um... I have a lot in my heart and a lot in my mind, so I'll try and formulate my question as clearly as possible. So among all the presentations today, I think this is, this is a topic that we're closest to as, as just general people. Um, when it comes to like, you know, today sitting here and listening to you, bats are cool, but when it comes to a pandemic, or even when we talk about endemics or epidemics, when it comes to a disease that impacts people and leads to death. Um, I'm curious about when um, pandemics such as COVID, as, as, as we've seen, or still probably looking at, um, do people, or I, I would say just governments all over the world, do they communicate with you to formulate the communication that would go towards people? Because uh, in your presentation, as you mentioned, there, there was a lot of talk about a certain part of the world being blamed for, for like corona, like as, as a cultural concept. We've seen that for Ebola as well. But I think as, as general, like communication, there, there was probably a gap for which people create their own, own concepts and act accordingly. I know that, unfortunately, I, I lost my dad during the pandemic and I was denied to perform the rituals of, um, of his burials. Um, essentially because, like, you know, thinking that this body contains COVID virus. So I was just wondering if, like, you know, the last, second last slide where it says, it does, like bats and human, there's no direct connection. There's, there must be like a transmitted, this, a, a host, right? So are these simple term information um, consulted with you who has the scientific concepts, who, who knows it for sure, um, that can come to the people or go to the people so that even kids nowadays, like, you know, when you look a certain way and other kids can become very mean um, and make their life very hard. But information, simple information, um, if that comes to you, it comes, comes from you. Also, in terms of ROM, because it hosts a lot of school programs, are these a part of those school programs as well to cut the cultural um, misunderstandings? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, I, I think, um you know, uh, communication, I think, is a, it's a very, you know, key aspect of it. And, you know, during that pandemic, you know, communication was always, you know, um, I think a stumbling block. But again, because, you know, the, the, the disease was, it, it was a moving target. It, it changed, um, you know, over the, the years of the pandemic. Um, yeah, but, but for sure, I, I think there needs to be, you know, more communication between, you know, government policy, uh, you know, research and how, and how to get, you know, that message out. Um, but I think in general, um, is that so, some of us might have gotten funding from, you know, the, you know, federal uh, agencies. 
Um, but it was really, um, you know, our own initiative saying that, you know, um, you know, we think that this research might help. Um, and, and we did get money from the, the government. So, um, so, it, so it wasn't the government saying, you know, can you help us? It was more like, you know, um, you know, this is our area specialty. Um, we, we think we might be able to do some research that might help out. Uh, but I, I agree that sometimes it's the communication, the messaging that uh, needs a lot of work. I can quickly comment on, I'm not sure I can answer the question precisely, but um, something that I'm always emphasizing when I, um, you know, um, I don't know, talk to the press or, or something like this is that um, there are, of course, these opinions that in a way bats harbor all these viruses that can jump um, between species, can in infect other species and essentially lead to death, right? And there's of course, um, a natural first response is why don't we eradicate them all? Then we, um, in a way, avoid the problem altogether, right? But this is certainly not the the way to go. It's rather probably man, humans need to um, give bats the space, right? In a way, a main problem is in a way we are um, moving into their territory. This is why um, we come in contact with bats more and more often, right, which increases the chance um, that um, transmissions can happen. And I think bats are beautiful organisms that in a way, um, so, so nature evolved, right, flying species that can cope with Ebola, Nipah, Hendra and coronaviruses um, without getting symptoms, right? So in a way, nature showed, shows us a way where if we learn how bats do it, maybe there is something we can do to improve the human immune system. So I think it's a, we should see bats as a great chance and not necessarily as a, as a threat. Although, of course, caution is always warranted. Yep. yep. I don't know if you heard the round of applause, uh, Michael, but they, they, they liked uh, your comment. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I would like to begin by thanking you for your presentation and the panel discussions. Um, I have two questions. The first one, I like the first question, is how your research will possibly lead us to come to a conclusion on the origins of the current COVID-19 virus. As you know, the media is very polarizing and I feel like as someone who's lived through this during her teenage years, um, it's very difficult to f come to a conclusion on if there is someone to blame or is there is there something else behind this or is this like a scientifically proven fact that the origins came from wet markets. And my second question is whether how or how close we are to fi figuring out what the intermediate host is in order to prevent this fire from happening again or to figure out the precautions we should be taking. Okay, uh, yeah, that, that's a great uh, question um, that uh, I, I think is still being uh, debated, um, you, know, uh, you know, as we speak. Um, I, I, I can just give you my own, you know, personal um, uh, opinion. Um, yeah, so, so I, I think it probably is more closely related uh, to the fact that, um, that there's a lot of unnatural settings, um, you know, where animals are coming together. Uh, and basically, that, that's how viruses, you know, jump from one species uh, to the next species. Uh, and, and as I sort of briefly mentioned that, you know, a lot of these viruses, you know, uh, you know we fight them off and nothing happens, uh, which is great. Um, but then there's that odd time where, you know, something uh, just seems to latch on uh, and, you know, starts causing uh, illness um, and becomes fatal. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, that you know, might be happening more often, uh, as I mentioned, you know, um, you know, with human expansion and stuff like that, uh, you know, we're getting, you know, closer to nature, uh, sometimes uh, in a, you know, bad kind of way. Um, so so I, I think that there might be the possibility of more of, you know, this type of thing happening, uh, as opposed to it not happening uh, as much. Um, but again, that, that just my own, you know, personal opinion, uh, other, you know, people, um, you know, might, you know, look at it a bit differently. Um, 
the second part uh, I've already forgotten, but uh, if Michael or Connor want to jump in. <laughs> I, I can chime in. Okay. <laughs> um, with regards to looking at not trying to identify someone to blame or, or really just trying to find the origins of where this came from, right? Just being apolitical of like, where did this come from? Um, based on all the data that multiple groups have worked on over multiple different countries and, and in a very unbiased way, it, we still don't know. Um, and that only gets better by sampling and by kind of a lot of identifying that it was the wet market or, or hypothesize that it was the wet market was just the sampling or the identifying identification of cases in and around and then correlating the, that data or the cases to the location so that at the very least you understand where it, where it originated and then you can kind of build hypotheses from there. Um, but just, I'm sure Michael can explain this better than me, but from a molecular look at the viral genome for SARS-CoV-2, it it really doesn't, it seems like a very natural occurrence. Like you have these small little single nucleotide polymorphisms, so like these single small changes in the genome that arise, you know, quite often in nature. You don't have this big evidence of like, oh, somebody might have taken a gene and moved it over. It it, it seems like a natural virus and, and all data has indicated that it's coming from nature somewhere and is likely accruing all of these mutations through different exposures, through different animals, because as a virus will move or infect, say, humans to bats or bats to humans, they're going to accrue a bunch of mutations to adapt to that host. And those are the, the mutations that we see in the genome. So it looks like it's a natural event. All the data supports that it. it's likely a natural event. And there's no, say, person or, or you know anything to blame aside from really just, I think, nature. But that also doesn't help identifying and, and looking at where did this come from, how did this happen, in order to prevent the next one. It, it's... You know, we can prepare as much as we can with vaccine banks and all of that, but to some degree there is a, a degree of probability and just, you know, random chance that bad things could possibly happen and then just trying to mitigate all those risks, I think. Did you want to uh, weigh in, Michael, or, or is that, do, do we sort of cover it uh, good enough? <laughs> um, I, have, I have nothing to add. Carl's okay. probably much more of an expert in, in this than, than, than I. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another question, yes. Um, hi, so I'm wondering, so you guys seem to be more researching the side of finding all the different types of viruses and maybe you mentioned in that way trying to find, figure out some way to get some sort of vaccine, that way in the future, you know, have something in place. Um, why not research or are you aware if there is any research happening more on the animal side of it? Um, so you said that the bats, they seem to be healthy. So do they have some antibodies or something that's why they're not getting sick and they're healthy and we are? Does it have something to do with us being you know, very far apart from them or is it that intermediate species? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that was one of the things why um, uh, why I thought it was great that you know we were able to collaborate you know both from you know the virus end but also from the host end of the bat uh, because you know there are two different ways um, you know to hopefully come you know uh, to a positive uh, conclusion um, so I, I think uh, um, yeah so, so I, I thought that that was um, you know what I you know liked about you know the, the collaborative project uh, that that we had uh, come up with. Uh, yeah, so we, we were trying to get the vaccines, um, uh, tr trying to find out how, um, you know, what the differences between the, the bat immune system and the human immune system is. I, I think that probably will take a little bit more work um, uh, down the road. Um, so, I, so I think that that's something that, uh, that there's still probably a lot of research uh, to come in the future for that. But, but it is something that we, we, we do want to do, yeah. I can, I can quickly add, um, yeah, okay. this is obviously the, maybe the million dollar question, right? You know, how can you as a bat be infected, right? And we know from experimental infections that in a way the, it's not that the, the virus in a way bounces off, right? The virus gets inside the body, it replicates, they keep it for a week or longer, 10 days, they shed the virus, just the bats, don't have any symptoms, right? They really seem to be um, be healthy, essentially. And um, there is now a lot of research in a way studying in a way how is their immune system different? How do they regulate their immune system different compared to other mammals? 
And there's also some progress already. There's, of course, lots of work remains to be done, but um, collaborators um, in, in Singapore have recently characterized um, a gene which has bad specific mutations. We also have that gene, um, but we don't really express it. So it's only in us present at a very low level. Mice don't have it at all. They lost that gene. And when um, Lin Fa Wang is the, is, is the person in Singapore, when he brings that bad gene into mice, um, they now survive an influenza infection, which is otherwise deadly. And they do this likely by controlling excessive inflammation, which is a key part of, also inflammation is a key part of a natural immune response. But um, what goes wrong in severe COVID-19 and, and many other infectious um, diseases is an overreaction of the immune system. So you may have heard about the cytokine storm or hyperinflammation. And this causes excessive tissue damage, right, in the lung, in other organs, and this is where people and other animals actually die. And this process of, in a way, preventing excessive uh, inflammation, controlling that process, this is something that bats mastered. And yeah, we and others try to, in a way, understand that at the level of comparing genomes, but also in a way, um, bats in captive colonies that people experimentally infect um, and as well also at the level of cell culture, right? You can do a lot of experiments with cells in a dish where no animal gets harmed and you bring in viruses and you study in a way how these cells actually respond. Okay, thank you. I'm going to hand it back to Valerie. Okay, uh, th thank you very much for listening and uh, staying for the end.